the endo meeting on November 1st. Uh, we have talked a bit about async context in the lobby, and that has given rise to a broader conversation. Mark and Jazz. All right. So the 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 idea that attracts me to this entire space is the following one. The, the way in which most software is built is that there is a, 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 a ball of source code that already exists. And then a large number of developers make changes to that, to that ball of software. And uh, part of that process is that one needs to review that code in order to understand how this change makes a difference to the original object. Um, this is different from the way in which we usually think about software, right? We usually think about, well, I don't know usually. There is a bunch of uh, context in which software is understood as a whole program. I, I assert that most software is built by having a ball of software already and then a bunch of changes being made to it. And that most of the review, most of the thing that you are doing when you are making changes is trying to understand how the, how the delta is going to affect the ball. The question that I have is how do you build software? How do you build programming languages? such that the amount beyond the diff that you need to grow your diff in order to understand what the effect of the change is, is smallest. Now, <laughs> and, 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 and I, will, I will further assert that there's two cases that I have thought about. One is the, the innocent case where you're like, oh, I, I'm, I'm just some... I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a good employee. I'm trying to I'm trying to do the good thing, and so my diff is not go is is not malicious. It might be innocently, uh, it might be innocently vulnerable, in which case the amount that you need to grow the software might be larger, or I might be a really bad guy, and uh, and and I'm I'm trying to do something tricky, and I have written a lot of tricky code in my life where. I, I know I can get it past a lot of people. And then, so the question is, not the question. I, uh, let, let, me make a, let me make a straw man argument. A programming language is a, is a safe programming language if the amount that a diff needs to grow when a change is made is small uh before a reviewer understands the code and i think that that is the property that one wants in a programming language and i think that that is true of ocap languages but i think that it is broader than ocap languages there you go so, that's that's so, the premise yeah so so um let me so there is there is i think we need to distinguish the language versus the discipline which is one can certainly write an OCAP program using, you know, violating OCAP discipline, but staying within OCAP rules where the program itself is safe, but very hard to analyze and then uh, admits differences which cause it to be safe unsafe, cause it to be unsafe in ways that are also very hard to analyze. So I think what you're looking for is not just a language definition criterion, but a programming practices criterion, such that if you're using a OCAP, you know, for, for hypothetical safety, um, you know, definition of safety, if you're using a, a safe language uh, and using recommended safe programming practices that you can express that you can express yourself in such a way as to produce this differential safety property. Is that fair? 
So I, I uh, okay, this is very useful. Uh, I when I say programming language, I usually think of programming language plus a linter. And so if it is possible to write a linter that enforces the, 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 the programming practices that you described, then, then uh, maybe I need a different term, but like th that's in scope. If it is you know, a handshake agreement between gentle persons, then, I, then, then it's outside my scope. Okay, so let me, let, me, let me give you the hard case. Principle of least authority. Uh, I claim principle of least authority is not something that can be checked by a linter. And it's essential. It's an essential programming practice to teach, to learn, to practice in order to create this differential safety property. I'm forced to agree with you, and and, and it's, it's but it's a different. So, in 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 practice, most of the bugs outside of outside of the Kaha project that I have found in life have been uh, business level problems, and they're polar violations, and they're not checkable because they're 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 sort of higher level. I, I'm not sure whether that's what you mean. If that's what you mean, then I agree, but I think that that is outside the scope of what I am thinking about. Uh, so I don't know if that's what I mean, um, the because I, I didn't I didn't understand the statement. So so for example, uh, it, you know every 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 lint rule that I could think of would have been passed by. By, by by this set of checks, but um, so uh, for, for example, in in a previous job, one of the most commonly reoccurring sims, high severity bugs was accidentally logging, um, accidentally logging um, uh, 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 sensitive PII to to okay. to logs, which which you don't want to do. And Great. the reason that occurred is not because the APIs were wrong. Like all the APIs did all of the right things. I've tried in the past to, to, to sort of experiment with banning strings because I think that that was part of the problem. But I think yeah. that even if I did all of that, it, I'm not sure that it would do all of the right things. But, but, like, but it, was, it was the combination of API calls that caused the problem. Does, does that make sense? But I think that that's that's different from the problem that I'm that I'm arguing for. It's a valid problem. It is a it's a valid problem. But I think that the the I think that there is a language problem that also arises. So if I write a program in a in a, if I write a if I write code in a memory unsafe language, I I have to. In, in the limit, I have to really look at the entire program in order to understand what a snippet of code does. That's not true in, in many other languages. It's not even true in JavaScript, right? Like, I think that in strict mode JavaScript, if I, if I see a snippet of code, the amount that I need to grow the code in order to understand the semantics of that change is the function boundary plus every call site. Okay, and then that, 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 so so let's let's grant that, but then say, if somebody could write a program where everything what you know where everything was channeled through one function call that was called from everywhere, and that, absolutely, that, and and that all of the the distinctions that you would normally make with separate functions were all based on dynamic data parameters. I mean, you so. And and if you if you did that, you could create a situation where the difference between a safe program and an unsafe program uh, was um, essentially impossible to analyze and could be and very, very a, yes. And as a reviewer, I would immediately reject. I, I know how to reject those programs. I know okay. how to recognize those programs and reject them. The problem is the the problem is the case where the reviewer. A human reviewer, like a like a person that understands, is not in a position to know is this, you know, is is this 
like, is this bad code or is this, uh, it, yeah, it, it, I, I, if as a reviewer, I don't know whether this is bad code or not, is the criteria. Okay. Is the reviewer allowed to, to make the judgment on criteria that we as reviewers understand is a reasonable thing to ask a person to exercise with knowledge of the purpose of the program, but is unreasonable to expect to be automated into a lint rule where the lint rule is just looking at code and unaware of the purpose of the program. This is helpful. So the lint rules for me, the, the, the programming language plus the lint rules are making it so that a human reviewer is able to make a decision sort of qu quickly, right? Which is what I'm trying to capture by how much more than okay. the diff do but, I need but, to but, look at. Okay, but the decision that the human reviewer, let's say with, with, uh, with the aid of all the lint rules and all the automation that one, that one might reasonably imagine, the job of the human reviewer is not to say safe or unsafe, but is to say safe or, or I give up. In other words, they're allowed to yes. reject even if the program happens to actually be safe. Correct. And even if, I, that, and, and and even if the program passes all of the automated lint rules, the the lint rules are there to make the life of the human reviewer better. Okay. And they they they're programming languages which I've had to review code for where I'm like at the end going I actually I'm going to approve this but I have no idea whether this is actually good or not and that's what I'm trying to avoid and I think that so OCAP languages. Okay. Uh, have have that property. Okay, then I think we're on the same wavelength here because uh, the I can sneak all the programming practice uh, discipline that I want under that agreement because anything that violates those programming practices, as far as I can tell, as a reviewer knowing the purpose of the program, I can just reject that whether it's actually a safe program or not. Right. And, and, and now that you are saying it that way, I mean, so I can write a linter that rejects everything and I know I'm safe, but like no progress is made. Um, I, I, I guess I also need to add to this, to this paradigm, something that allows progress to be made. And I, yeah. I have not thought about that. Okay. Yes. Yes. You need to, it needs to be possible to, for any reasonable programming goal, it needs to be possible to write a program, sorry, programming goal, functionality goal, and safety criteria. It needs to be, right. for any reasonable combination of functionality goal and safety criteria, it needs to be practical, not just possible, to write a program that achieves the functionality goal, obeys the safety criteria, and that would pass a reasonable human reviewer under this set of reviewing criteria. I, I accept that as a as a um, uh, you know, as a liveness criteria, as a criteria of, of what you must be able to achieve. Um, and 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 because of the reasonable part of that criteria, I don't know how to do this test. Right, I, I'm not. I don't have the expertise needed. To, to know how to do this. I, I know how to do the other parts, but the a reasonable human being is not something I do I have a I have a good programming model for. And and so I, but one of the things that I have found about OCAP languages and the thing that like bugs me a lot about the async context thing is that um I, I I think that OCAP languages are reasonable. I, I think I might even be able to mathematically show that OCAP languages, you know, the 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 diffs grow less on average. I, I I think that this should be doable, right? We should be able to like look over Endor Goric's code base and show that the amount of code that somebody had to look at in order to decide whether to LGTM. A, a, a diff or not was small. 
I think that that is not true for 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 languages for many other languages. Uh, okay. But I do not know how to measure uh, reasonableness of of contribution. Okay, so let me let me let me raise a definitional problem here. An async context is a great example for 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 raising this problem, uh, which is. Um, uh, if we agree that async context um, uh, is hard to analyze with regard to safety, then under the reviewing criteria we just stated, uh, we could allow async context into the language and then ban it from our good programming practices such yeah. that a, a reviewer looking at a program, seeing that it uses async context at all, could then reject the program. Now, I, let me let me suggest how to solve this definitional problem um, so that you can't just, I mean, if you can sneak async context into the language while claiming safety because a reviewer could just reject anything that had one, then you could sneak in all sorts of things. You could sneak in, you know, peek, at, peek and poke at arbitrary memory locations because then you could just reject the program that had them. And I think the answer to that is that the reviewer has to not be judging the whole program. The reviewer has to be judging the defensive code that is supposed to maintain, provide functionality and maintain a safety property in the context of coexistence with offensive with offensive code with possible adversarial code where the code itself is a black box is the code is unexamined and that all that the reviewer has access to are the safety constraints that the defensive code can impose on the offensive code such as um the the fact that it's run in a confinement box and only given capabilities x y and z um, uh, and that that kind of review, partial, you know, reviewing of, um, of, you know, defensive code and the presence of offensive code, the coexistence with the offense, where you have to quantify over all possible offensive code, uh, is the way you, um, you get past this definitional hole. And that's, I would say... Exactly what we did with async context is we analyzed for defensive code that didn't use async context, what kind of attacks async context would enable for offensive code that was thereby assumed unreviewed that was using async context to, to overcome defenses by code that was not using them. And so I understand what you're saying. I, I have a, so my, my, my original definition stands, right? But my original definition was how much more, I, somebody sent me a diff, how much more of the code than the diff that they sent me do I need to review? And and I think that that captures the thing that you are that that you're capturing about offensive and defensive code. Like if if I suddenly have to look at the whole program, that that's something. If I still have to only look at a little bit, that's something else. And I think that the latter is better. Okay. And I think that 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 you know it's and I I I think that the length of code is is wrong, but I don't have a better. I don't have a better I don't have a better definition but length of code is my is my my working metric. Okay. So the a offensive defensive thing cannot be aligned with length of code. The it, the it cannot. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, but 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 so the 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 problem that I have with the async context uh, uh definition so it aligns well with what you just described, right? And and you not only aligns well with that, it also says how much damage can be done. And the amount of damage that can be done, if I remember right, is, is actually pretty small, right? Like there's some amount of uh, a, a, a bit context that can be communicated 
uh, by a cooperating code. Am, am I right in that? I, I can't remember that, that, exactly. That, that, that's correct. It's, it's, it's that it enables it. I mean, it's, it's actually, it's very tight. And this is one of the reasons why we allowed it is that um, the, it enables communication across a boundary. So, you know, so, you know, Alice creates a boundary between Bob and Carol. The boundary is supposed to prevent Bob and Carol from interacting in some ways. Uh, if Bob and Carol have async context and, and use it, and Alice, is, her code doesn't mention async context. Maybe it, it predates when async context was written in the language. Um, it's... Uh, Bob and Carol can still only communicate with async context when they could have communicated without it. So it's not right. that it enables the communications channel when there wasn't. It's that it's the observability by Alice, by Alice's membrane, of the difference between communicating and not communicating. That so is... I the the threat of async context, the threat in the, the the differential attack by Bob and Carol. So 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 I I I agree and I like I'm okay I you know I'm okay with this, but it it fails my definition of security by 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 this this hand wavy definition that I have because let's say that there was some there was some connection between Bob and Carol. A diff introduced an explicit communication channel between Bob and Carol. Okay. What I don't know, like how much more do I need to know? And, and that's the part that I don't quite understand. Like how much more do I need to know when I see a new connection between Bob and Carol? Oh, they might, they, there is a previously disconnected channel that is now connected that is not evident to me from a diff right like mm -hmm. the the how how much more of the code do i need to look at in order to be like oh shit like those guys did not think like not those guys the programmer did not realize that they were enabling a new style of communication uh, I, I think that that's that like that's the critical place mm -hmm. and I think that that is violated by by async context in a way that many other new introductions that are yeah it, that that many other pieces of code don't introduce. Mm -hmm. So I, I would um, ag agree that it is violated. The investigation that had the positive result is how small the violation was. And, and uh, the, the, but the, but but you you're the one like you as the designer of the language are making that call, and I as the writer of the code don't know it, and I think that like that that's where the problem like I mean C C designers will always say like oh you should have known like you should have known like don't write code like this man like you know allocate code and deallocate code before you use it and uh, no uh, allocate code before you use it uh you know you're you're like it's in the spec like don't don't you know don't don't okay. do that okay i need to talk about the standardization process as a social process um if it was simply the language was just something that i was responsible for as it's sole designer and the proposal for async context was something that I could just veto and keep out of the language, uh, I would do so. Um, uh, but that socially was not the situation. Uh, certainly I still did have the power to veto, but it was in a social context where we're all making trade-offs and we all need to be make, making trade-offs in good faith. And the uh, and so the 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 issue is what what is the nature of the unsafety being introduced on the one hand, and on the other hand, 
how compelling is the functionality it would enable? And on the third hand, um, the for the functionality that seems com that 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 for which you can understand why some parties see that functionality as compelling, you know, functionality we can sympathize with. Is there any safer way to provide the functionality? And for, so I would say that, you know, there, and this is a judgment call. I mean, this, this, this phrasing it this way certainly does not give you a decision procedure. It's a judgment call. And we just made the judgment call that the threat here is small, the compellingness of the functionality to some parties, not us, is large. Uh, we can sympathize very well with why they want it. Uh, and uh, we, you know, together we iterated in a very, very, you know, cooperative, good faith manner to jointly arrive at a design which is the safest way to provide the functionality. Um, and, and also, we did it at a time when we were present, and we know the issue is not going to go away. And <laughs> so we have effectively plugged a, a gaping wound, <laughs> prevent, preventing a, the wor worse outcome from happening when we're not here. I, 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 I think I should yield at this point. Uh, man, it is so tempting to say one more sentence but I'm not going to because that's just going to cause the conversation to continue. I'm, I, I, I think I understand where this came from, Mark. I, I understood this before too. I just, my guiding principle is, is slightly different. It is very aligned with, with, with a whole bunch of things uh, with people in this group, but uh, it's, it was different and it was weird because I suddenly realized, oh, it's not entirely overlapping. It's, you know, there's a Venn diagram and they, there are cases where I would choose differently. And that, that, that was interesting. Okay, Chaz, you have a homework assignment. Draw that Venn diagram. <laughs> okay, fine. I will send it to this group next time I join. For what it's worth. I am exceedingly sympathetic to your position. Um, that that is a that is a position I have held in the past, and and still do. As as Mark said, it's competing values. Uh, at risk of um, further railing the conversation, what is the async context? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but but in but in two sentences and no more. It is an object that represents a capability to store a value on your long async stack trace and retrieve it later. How'd I do? That's like not pretty, good. pretty good, I think, yeah. Um, I, I, for one, look forward to using this future feature to track turns and basically to virtualize the a capability that is currently closely held by JavaScript debuggers that if we pre present an API where all capabilities to schedule future work are um, in cahoots using async context, um, we will be able to uh, create a causal graph for all scheduled work in an endo context and report that to something like open telemetry. That's, and that is, that is one of the use cases that is a motivating case from Versal's perspective as well. Say, uh, hand up Jazz. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I mean, I'm embarrassed, uh, don't tell Mark, uh, but one of the companies that I advise for we're building this thing that allows you to track uh, uh, basically causal graphs, and at the moment, uh, set timeout and, and a bunch of other of these of these basically cause us to lose context. 
and we're we're doing all kinds of really awful shitty things to virtualize those guys only in order to collect like what might have been the uh the 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 causal effect and i will definitely use this it's, it doesn't stop me from complaining yeah. about it yeah, so, exactly. I, so I, I, actually, I'm going to, to use that to make another point, which is um, part of the, a lot of the justified uses of ASYN context, even you know, justified by the people who want it, is the ability to instrument and gather diagnostic information for analyzing execution, not for use by the code that's executed. And the one of the things that that you know I certainly accept is that the the normal locality and polar considerations within the program that is executed is does not apply to diagnostics does not apply to for example uh, we allow debuggers to see, to look into closures and see the values of closed over variables to just violate boundaries all over the place. And the, so part of the thing that makes this whole thing very confusing is that JavaScript, it's often the case that the code that accumulates diagnostic information for purposes of analyzing execution are not as cleanly separated into a meta level as the debugger API is. And when they're at the object level and they're kind of on their honor to not affect the execution, but only to gather diagnostics, um, then you're in sort of a confusing situation with regard to the, the, the justified authority. Yeah. So <clears throat> which is to say that we can also look forward to the next JavaScript blockchain, which puts the uh, <laughs> the uh, um, the the submitters <laughs> Ethereum <laughs> on async context, and then a whole bunch of um, checking whether you whether the <clears throat> the submitter has permission to do a per particular action on async context, and um, and. Yeah, it will be done. Um, it will be a mistake, but it will be done. And we can thank ourselves for enabling it. Um, <laughs> um, with that, we have a, there, there are a couple of things that I do want to, uh, so for one, Sala had some follow-up questions from the CES meeting, and I want to make sure that we give him some floor time. Um, do I go ahead now, or do you want to uh, plan other stuff first? Uh, after that, I would like to talk to Mark about refactoring CES, uh, change, changes to CES that will be necessary in order to get uh, parity between XS hardened JavaScript and CES shim hardened JavaScript. Okay. Yeah, so so I think I, I was making a little bit of a leap when I uh, uh, drew a parallel between uh, the separation, um, uh, like the finalization after snapshots and what I've observed in X snaps behavior. Um, and I just wanted to make sure, like, like I know it was maybe a tangent to the discussion, but maybe it wasn't even on point. Um, you know, I sometimes do that. Um, so to clarify what I observed in X snap is um, when we, um, assume we're taking a snapshot midway before the resolution, but before the settling of promises, um, you would you would then realize uh, as the um, as the instance is uh, finalizing or terminating um, that there are messages related to unhandled uh, promise rejections or similar aspects of promises. Um, that you would expect would be anticipated and um, mitigated um, so as to not produce messages, um, um, you know, related to um, the, um, I guess, um, uh, life, lifespan or life cycle of uh, promises. Um, now, 
what I also observed, of course, is if you reload the snapshot in a new instance, um, the promises retain their state and they resolve or reject as expected. Um, but I, I didn't like deep, I didn't dig deep enough to understand um, if there are any side effects of um, the un, um, unmitigated um, life cycle um, um, aspects that happen with these promises after the snapshots in the original um, context. I have a follow, yeah. I have a clarifying question. Sure. Um, what you say implies that it is possible to take a snapshot when the event loop or right where the event queue is non-empty. Is that the case? Um, yeah, I believe I believe um, in in, uh, in in that example, um, one one command was basically create a bunch of promises and then um, but but trigger the X snap command with the uh, right snapshot um, and then terminate. I'm sorry, maybe I'm not I'm not getting to the question the way you asked it. Um, so, yeah, maybe uh, uh, could you try to elaborate the question a little bit differently? Sorry. So uh, I'm asking. I'm trying to. Um get a better understanding of what XSnap does it, because it sounds like it's doing, it's able to do something that's outside of my mental model of what it is able to do. Um, is, uh, it, it seems to, it seems that your, that your question implies that snapshots contain, uh, the, capture not just the heap, but the event queue. And I did not know that. Uh, yeah. So, um, I actually can take one second to, bring the commands on the screen. Um, sure. um yeah, so um but don't let me uh don't let me distract and if we have to like uh uh pick up this after you shift gears um that would be fine. I, I just don't want us to drag this and um no, no, you know. I'm curious. <laughs> uh, there, there, uh, there, there might there might be a distinction here between what XSnap can do and versus what how swing set uses XSnap. Uh, so a, a turn is the interval from an empty stack to an empty stack. And a crank is the interval from an empty stack and empty promise queue to an empty stack and empty promise queue. Uh, swing set only snapshots between cranks. It sounds like XSnap itself is able to snapshot between turns uh, and therefore include the promise queue in the snapshot, but swing set never uses it that way. Yeah, so so um, I think the best I could do is actually bring the examples up. Um, let's see. Right. So, um, so I think, yeah, this is where the, the this example starts, and then I can bring the commands here. Um, yeah, so I've broken this into um, one that runs without snapshots, and then this is the one that runs with snapshot. Uh, and as you can see, the first command does the before, writes um, the snapshot, and then the second command, which could run in a separate instance, um, um, reads the snapshot and then executes um, the after. And so with, with that, with the before behavior, um, there's like unhandled rejections and, um, and then in the next invocation with the restored snapshot, um, they're being resolved or, you know, uh, whatever the behavior is at this point. Um, is my my screen actually showing or? Your, sc your screen is showing, yes. Oh, perfect. Good, because I, I didn't want to do like a florist moment here, so. <laughs> Uh, 
I have not dug any deeper, but I did find this a little bit curious and I tried to imagine why I would see those messages. And um, not that I know deeply um, um, about what, what the behavior was expected to be, um, but it was a curious um, observation at least. So let me make sure I'm understanding. Um, the behavior that you're getting when you continue past the snapshot is what's at the top part of the screen, and that sees rejections. And then restoring from the same snapshot is what you see then in the lower part of the screen, and right. it's different. It's not You're not seeing the same rejection. No, no, those rejections, I believe, occur after writing the snapshot during the finalization of the instance. Oh. Right? So so I think this is what I meant by um, mitigation that needs to take place because the behavior of a particular feature like like a an asynchronous um, you know process or a promise or you know whatever you want to um, uh, say is that if we're taking a snapshot for finalization, then um, the uh, the state should be addressed in some way that it does not have any side effects um, related to promises that are meant to be resolved after the snapshot is resumed. Well, so can you describe, if not show, um what before and after are if you have already i apologize oh, absolutely no, no no that's that's um i i did not write those and you know i i just found it a very very curious experiment so uh mm -hmm. so the after maybe i should flip them around but I, I, it's okay i'll just keep them that way uh, i'll just not fuss about it um uh, want to change their order right now <laughs> Uh-huh. Okay. I don't know who wrote this. And I'm pretty sure it's just me lazy because hovering will probably give me a hint. Uh, um, no yeah. context in this case. So, uh -huh. Right. So our expectation is that these will, you know, resolve on the next turn. And I know that there isn't any finalization. There's nothing here special about finalization. It's curious. So so where does the snapshot happen? I don't see any code causing a snapshot. Um, oh, it's a command line argument that is passed right after passing. Uh, so, so I think the way the way the commands are parsed is that actually this will be uh, picked up when setting up um, the environment, and um, uh, it will be prepared to write a snapshot. Uh, and then this will uh, be picked up when seeing what needs to be executed. And so this will be ex this will be called. And since um, there are no awaits, if I'm not mistaken, I'm just you know assuming based on what I saw in the execution, um, then there's nothing really uh, waiting. And so the XNAP um, uh, instance is terminating resulting in um, there being unhandled uh, rejections. Um, so go, go back to before.js. Uh, yeah. There, so there. let me let me let me let me try to restate to make sure I'm understanding. There's um, there's when evaluating before.js, there's evaluating the code itself, and then there's all of the further execution that is spawned by this code by queuing things into the promise queue. And it's if I understood what you were saying correctly, the what what what's happening is that the snapshot happens after this code is evaluated, yes. but before all of the jobs that it spawned onto the promise queue right. happen. Okay. Uh, yeah. But but it does it does create um, it does meet the criteria of there are promises that have not been handled. Um, um, I can't remember what it's called, but um, yeah, um, that's actually that's actually this might be a bug. Um, 
there, there may be a bug here. Yeah, can you take a look again at the log? Um, the command line probably should drain the promise queue before allowing the snapshot to be taken. Um, that, well, and maybe it even. I think swing set does that. Uh huh. But X snap, it sounds like X snap does not. It leaves it up to a higher level mechanism policy decision by something like swing set. In any case, this behavior, if, assuming that it does not draining the promise queue before taking the snapshot, the behavior is consistent with our expectations. The unhandled rejections. Um, the unhandled rejections should be emitted. I, it's actually kind of curious that they are not in the second example. Yeah, that's the th that's exactly what I find puzzling. Is 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 the behavior after taking the snapshot should be the same as the behavior after restoring from that snapshot? Um, but the after oh, yes, that's right actually because actually handling it's it's sorry yeah. I, I apologize. It's actually taking the the promises that were left. Um, un, un, um, terminated in some way, let's put it this way, a chain that did not terminate. And it's actually terminating each one. And as such, it is actually getting that output. But over here, it was like the chain was never completed, right? Um, it was like you took a snapshot mid-chain and that leaves um, uncertainty because we don't know what you want to do next, really. I mean, um, yeah, the, the the unhandled rejections exist in a strange space. They it's both <laughs> they they should not be revealed this way, but it's not clear that there's a better way to reveal them at the command okay, line. I'm, I'm, I'm still confused. The in the first case, we take a snapshot, and then what the so at the point of the snapshot. There's, uh, can you show before.js again? Uh, yeah, so before.js is at the top left and after is just um, bottom left now. That's actually the case. Uh, I misunderstood uh, something. I think that it, I think that the event queue may actually have been drained before the snapshot. The difference is that when the first program exits, um, nothing has subscribed to any of the rejected promises and that causes the unhandled rejection prints. And another thing that I missed, which is surprising to me, is that uh, before.js and after.js appear to be sharing a lexical scope somehow, um, much like a REPL interaction and not consistent with evaluation of separate programs. Right. Uh, they're loaded as uh, scripts uh, since uh, they're not .mjs and the uh, dash m flag is not supplied. In, Sloppy in... scripts or strict scripts? I have no idea, honestly. They must because... be. Yeah. Strict so... scripts, the const p0 in one would not be the p0 in the other. Right. Yeah, if it were var, then it would then it would work even sloppy, I'm sorry, even strict, but not const. Yeah. Yeah. So we're we're clearly evaluating in sloppy mode, which isn't terribly surprising, really. It's a okay, cool. Um Sala, have we answered your question? I think that. I at least am satisfied that there is not a defect here. Look, I'm I'm not sure I understand yet. Let me let me try to state what I think I understand. You can confirm or deny. Um, in the first case where we get the unhandled rejection, it's not only just happening after the snapshot, but it's that what's going on after the snapshot is that we're terminating the program without running after JS. Whereas in the second case, it's not just that we've restored from the snapshot, it's that following the restoration from, from restore, following the restoration from snapshot, we are running after JS 
And therefore, there should be an observable difference in the first case and the second case, not because of the snapshot or what's happening before the snapshot, but just because there's two different things that are happening after the snapshot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, which would, uh, so which is to say that uh, it would be less surprising if after we take the snapshot in the first case, we simply ceased executing instead of act, instead of going through the process of tearing down the realm. Um, uh, however, I think a point to raise here is um, whatever subscribes to those events in any capacity may uh, may know more or may know what they need. I don't know which is the right word here. Um, um, to, so, so I think if we're using snapshots as a way for persistence, we may need a well-defined behavior that once you invoke that it's time for a snapshot, you should not have any more awareness of what is going on until you're uh, restored, basically. We're like, you know, it, it kind of feels a little bit like, uh, you know, a little bit more about the state of what's going on after um, wh when the continuity is really that the snapshot is giving you that illu that um, um, illusion of yeah you know well, basic basically in the in the first example this is very similar to the tree falling in the forest um, that it's not harmful that execution continues because we're making no record of what happened and no and no side effects outside of the X snap container. Are possible since the swing set that's around it is not going to listen for any of these messages. Um, so basically, it continues to execute without any record being made of it happening, and it's unobservable, except clearly yeah. here. I, I, it well defined, I think, is what I mean. So separating this from other kind of messages or errors that could happen after the snapshot, so that what is expected to be a side effect of um, a snapshot that is inactionable, or better yet, a tree in a forest. Nobody needs to actually know about it, um, but it, you know, it happens. Uh, versus something that could happen after taking the snapshot that could invalidate the state of the snapshot for whatever reason. Um, which I, I I don't know if such a situation. No, that that situation does not occur. I I would not. I, I would be, uh, I'm an advocate of making a change to XSnap to um, remove the code that causes the realm to tear down after taking the snapshot, because that would eliminate this divergence, the, right. this curiosity. I, uh, what I, what I, causes the, after taking the snapshot, what causes the termination? Um, there, there is an XS command um, that I think is being applied in something in the C analog of a finally block um, to destroy um, the object called the everywhere in excess, which represents the the execution the execution the JavaScript execution context. When that gets teared, when that gets torn down, a side effect of that is that it's executing the unhandled rejection. Events. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. This is basically in in XSnap's model, we do not need to clean up the realm when we exit because the operating system is going to collect the page. So that could be omitted in our particular case. If we were running in a system that had multiple XS environments, we couldn't. Yeah. Um, I mean, in WebAssembly, I can literally say as soon as the snapshot is ready, just destroy the whole thing. Like, don't don't even uh, give it back any handle um, after the FS write of the snapshot, and mm -hmm. it it wouldn't matter. Um, it's actually not going to violate anything accidentally if I do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think I would I would favor making the modification on the inside of XSnap. In any case, 
thank you for thank you for sharing this. This has been insightful. Yeah, Sala, could you file a bug uh, or a feature request for exactly that kind of unobservable termination? Um, I think I want to understand it a little bit more before I do, uh, because okay. we're actually writing this loop um, in the code right now. Um, so, so I'm not sure if it would be a bug to upstream or if it's something we could actually handle um, in our own implementation. Oh, well, both of the implementations in like the WebAssembly and the C worker are both ours. Uh, yeah. So, so I don't think this would up. Oh, so you mean on the XNAP pub uh, repo? Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. I'm sorry, you're, we're referring to XSNAP and WebAssembly in the same sentence? Yes. Uh, Sala is working on compiling, uh, creating a WebAssembly version of XSNAP. Ah, 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 ah. Right. Okay. Got it. I'm, I was missing that context. Yeah. Well, this, this change in behavior does not require changes to XS. It only requires changes to XSNAP. And yeah, we could, we could make the behavior better for just the WebAssembly version, but I'm I'm suggesting that this should be the same. The, uh, yeah. yeah. I agree. Consistency is important, especially for uh, having a unified testing. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, I, do, I do have more questions from Mark. They, um, with regard to factoring CES, uh, to enable us to do some parity analysis between XSS and node CES, um in a test 262 environment. Um, Mark, do you want to linger on this call or? Yeah. Okay. Let's linger on this call with recording on if nobody minds. Yeah, sounds good to me. Um, the What I'm working on at the moment is uh, getting a 262 harness set up such that I can uh, start building out hardened JavaScript tests that establish parity between uh, the hardened JavaScript implementation on XS and the hardened JavaScript implementation on Node with the CES shim. Um, there, will be, there will definitely need to be a shim in both cases. Ideally, we can just run the same shim in both environments. Uh, there were surprises. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first of which is that test 262, and this shouldn't have been surprising, test 262 defines a, an assert global that the CES shim stomps. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> um, and this is one of the things that test 262 is um, ardent about <laughs> including in the environment in a prelude. Uh, and I, so for now, I've gotten unblocked by simply making those no op, the no opping out the harness. Um, but that's certainly not going to be satisfying in the long term, <laughs> since we would very much like uh, to have a hardened, hardened JavaScript test suite eventually included in Test 262 proper. Yeah. Uh, that's, um, that's a, that is perhaps beyond the pale, but in the, for the sake of, a, idealism I, I don't know it, it it this is not actually that much of a problem because i what i'm i'm unblocked in two ways one is gutting the harness the other way to uh but the other way forward would be uh oh but gutting the harness is undesirable because excess already wrote a whole bunch of test 262 style tests for behavior of compartment etc which rely upon the existing assert harness <laughs> So in, in, in order to share as much code as possible between excesses test 262 tests and this, um, my preference is to continue using the assert that is defined by test 262. <laughs> and to that end, I'm unblocked because I was able to compile a version of CES that omitted the assert shim, which is wow. basically all of the uh, all of the assert layer is internal to the CES shim and does not have to be stomped into global. Um, so if I just do lockdown shim and compartment shim, it runs to completion um, the, on node. Uh, the the excess tests run to completion on node. Right? Some of them, 
I I'm not that far along to be clear, but I've gotten farther this way. Um, can we, is it, ugh, um, the next challenge yeah. is that the excess test harness, um, is running the session prelude in strict mode. Uh -huh. I'm, it is unclear to me. Okay, I, I don't have enough information yet on this, but I think it, it's something is tripping up the Sesshim's detection of a sloppy mode environment um, because it can't oh. do the magic eight lines in um, under strict. Okay, well, I, I do remember that we do have in the session something that's supposed to detect and and preemptively fail on that yeah i it it might be that i just need to run the session under an eval in the prelude which would be weird but doable um, um and, we're, we're going, chris i'm gonna i'm just gonna say uh all of this sounds so familiar but 10 years ago. <laughs> um, test 262 does a whole bunch of really awful things. Uh, and I wanted to go out of my way not to run uh, the Kaha tests uh, without changing 262 because it was changing a lot. Um, uh, uh, two things to look for. Uh, I think Wait, the, the the free this is the way to test for for strict mode, right? And we do, yes. We use that. And is that and that's not working? That is working. Or rather, the the detector is working and it is causing the session to fail under the test two six two environment, thereby making it difficult to validate the resulting environment. So, <laughs> Richard? Oh yeah, for, uh, first comment is that we're gonna need to establish vocabulary here because like harness and shim and you know which assert are you talking about are all going to be you know highly potentially confusing yeah um second to that like let's assume for the moment that we've got it solved um the structure of the test 262 environment, as it turns out, isn't that hard to comprehend. It's basically what I broke down for you in the in the Slack thread, where it does um, first a uh, a use strict as directed by front matter, and then the two test 262 harness files, and then in the case of the runner, any prelude files that are indicated, and then the content of the test. Um, the environment right. itself, I think tests only care, care about the addition of probably two globals. One of them is called like dollar test 262 or, you know, something like that. Uh, and the other one called assert. So given that, um, that assert is the kind of thing that any number of libraries introduce, we should probably have that kind of compatibility anyway. And if we want to skip tests in strict mode, uh, at least for the time being, that's also really straightforward to do. Yeah, that's yeah. There's a there's case. a bit there's a flag in the front matter that I'm saying that it's a only strict and no strict are the flags. Um so I can say no strict or only strict or all of these tests and that would be fine. Can somebody confirm or deny whether um, XS implements sloppy mode at all? Yes, it does. XS does. Uh, we know that because we're currently running the SES shim with the eight magic lines or the 12 magic lines now uh, on XS. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so so but, what I'm suggesting is that um, rather than specify tests with no strict or only strict that is the runner itself that just filters away every uh resolved test that calls for strict mode i see 
So you, you'd, you'd run all tests except those that are only strict, basically. And then if we ever update the session by some means to function in strict mode, then you just remove that filter and now you've got better test coverage. I see. While you know, presumably retaining all of the tests of the original test 262. Yeah, or you know, again, subject to whatever filtering is appropriate. Um, but mm -hmm. I think, I think largely the answer is going to be uh, run a subset of tests uh, identified by a very simple filter and expect all of them to pass. Mm -hmm. um, keeping in mind, however, that there are certainly scattered throughout test two six two tests that depend upon mutability of things that the that we would harden. Well, yeah, so running the existing 262 suite isn't actually a goal in this project. Um, I, I don't need to include any of the normal two, test 262 style. We just need the harness for the tests we intend to add to 262. Well, with the, I mean, that's, that's a great first goal. I think what we where we need to eventually land in order to get this into the language standard uh, is that uh, just like the existing test metadata distinguishes, you know, str you know, only strict and all that, uh, we need additional metadata that says for the existing tests which ones should work under hardened JavaScript. Oh, oh yeah, right. and, and that's just a new feature flag. Yeah, um, I mean, it's yeah. I'm just I, I'm saying eventually. I'm not saying we need it immediately, but I think we do we do need it. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see so Jeff. That'd be great to see in, in the tests um, so that yeah. you've got a very clear filter for these depend upon mutable primordial state, for instance. Um, yep. Yeah. All right. Well, I think what I've I've gotten what I need from this call, and that is a little bit more clarity about stuff. Um the there, yeah, and I should check and see whether I can reframe all of the tests to use assert the the test two six two assert without without having to remove the assert shim from the test shim. That's How this this conflict of assert of assert is is uh, distressing. Um, how incredibly painful would it be for Cess it, for the for Cess itself to treat assert only as something importable from the assert module rather than defining an assert global. Uh, that is a matter of eval twins, basically. Ah, right. 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 Okay. Wait, you need you need to give me more words on that because that's exactly what I did. <laughs> I had like a whitelisted test assert. I think it was called test assert. Uh, what is a assert twins? So eval twins is this incredible. Oh, sorry. E eval twins is Mark's neologism for uh, the the same code evaluated twice in the same realm, producing identity discontinuities in their prototype chain, et cetera, et cetera. You, you say that like that is understandable. That is definitely not <laughs> understandable. Let's say that again. So if you, you have one program, that program is going to cons is not pure. That program will have some internal state. It will create prototypes and constructors for various classes, et cetera. And because this is JavaScript, you can evaluate it twice, which would result in two disjoint object graphs with separate state. And the assertion library that the session produces does have some shared and internal hidden state. And that is to say the um, error wrapping unwrapping, we redact errors um, we redact errors in CES. So you can use the assert module to redact an error, uh, or not the assert module, the assert global can be used to create errors that have been redacted that um, that can then, that intermediate stack frames cannot inspect. They're opaque except for the message. 
Um, but the, uh, the original stack and uh, the unredacted message can be revealed through another function. Um, if you were to instantiate the assertion shim twice, errors generated by one would not be revealable to the un, un, one, one, one assertion, one assertion libraries redacted errors would not be unredacted by the other. So there is a strong, there's a good reason for there to be a single instance of the assert module and for it to be in global scope so that it can be discovered by anybody who needs it. Um, and, and in general, the unredaction doesn't happen uh, as far as the user is concerned, doesn't happen by the assert module. The unredaction happens by the console. Um, and so there's, and there's, and, but, the, but the entangling of a certain console raise all the same issues. Yeah, and uh, in any case, Matthew and I are both championing um, further work to make the coupling between console and the assert looser, but... Um, as am I, for that matter. Yeah, the uh, we uh, we'll get there, and I'm not sure whether this work forces us to get there sooner. Um, I think it, it that would only be the case if we want to run something in this test two six two environment that depended upon the uh, the hardened JS assert, because otherwise you can just put in a mode where the hardened JS assert is missing and, and that would be okay. Yeah. I need to check whether the assert is reflected on the buck 262 object as well. If it is, then I can reframe all of these tests to be more specific mm -hmm. about which assert they're using. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, or just make the ses shim do that if it senses that's in the test 262 environment. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I, I've got to if, it's, if it's running in uh, in sloppy mode, you might not even need to go that far because in sloppy mode you could just replace the assert created by the test two six two harness. Well, it does that. To be clear, the prelude does overwrite test two six two's assert. The problem is that all of the tests that Modable wrote depend upon test two six two's assert. Oh, specific behavior from it. Yeah. Okay. Then, then who wrote? Modable. Modable wrote a whole bunch of tests for hardened JavaScript behaviors that I would like to use since, since I'd like to use them because they've already established that their tests pass <laughs> in this environment. And since we're looking to establish parity, it's handy to be able to use their tests and just run them under our environment and verify that they pass for us too. Can, can you just ask them how they're running it? Can you just ask them? Yes. What what question would I ask? Oh, are they running test 262 tests with these additional tests? Maybe I'm misunderstanding what is happening here. Modable writes the JavaScript engine access and they have written test 262 tests for it before their additional the additional features that they've written above and beyond javascript could i clarify one thing i've found from their code base um so they actually build a special build of access called xst um and that is the only build that actually um operates as a as a REPL or any kind of like Node.js runtime or something like that. Um, and, and in their code base, they're treating XNAP and XST as the special cases. Um, and um, if you look at the um, XST uh, source, it's it's a lot of work that they're doing. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit scary and it requires threads and- um, they, They've gone, uh, they've gone They've gone out of their way to make sure that XS can appear in test 262. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's it's what they built it for. So, which is why it happens to be part of the general tool chain for folks that are 
on TC39, like we're using Brian Terrelson's test to test 262 harness, um, which which drives modules excess among other engines as just one of the different agent types it supports. This is a thing that I did not know until this week. I thought that I was going to have to do a whole bunch more harness building. Um, my predecessor on Endo, uh, JF, had done a whole bunch of work to get a Test 262 runner under tape, which I thought I was going to have to replicate under AVA. Turns out I do not have to do that. I can just use Brian Terrelson's trick. And, and, and for what it's worth, Richard, I've managed to do that without modifying it. The Prelude system is working fine. Wow, excellent. Yeah. Um, and it, it runs in the right place. I had thought that, so currently uh, in, in Brian Terrelson's 262 harness, what happens is that every test gets a, um, all, of, all of the scripts that are in the harness plus all of the additional scripts that were expressly included in the front matter of the test um, get concatenated before the text of your test and they all get evaluated together as a single block. Um, and uh, so, which, which is to say that you can only run prelude stuff like the session that I want to test under after the harness which is to say, I can't choose to have the harness overwrite mm -hmm. the assert that we provide. I have to accept that um, that Sesshim is going to stamp, overstep, that's going to stomp over the assert, the, the, uh, the test 262 assert when it runs. I One of the ideas I considered was reversing that by augmenting the test runner to allow me to run code before the harness and includes. Mm -hmm. That turns out to not be necessary, but I just have to share with everyone here because I thought it was really clever. I was thinking that I would just add a dash dash overture flag. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't need to. <laughs> Wouldn't yeah, uh, opening up that namespace, where else do we go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dash dash coda <laughs> dash dash. <laughs> it, it I mean, uh, you need cleanup as well. There's surely encore. <laughs> like, there's 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 a, there's a lot of work here. <laughs> I may have to for uh, for next time April first rolls around. I might have to have a pull request ready to go <laughs> just to. <laughs> <laughs> I found a, a few missing features. <laughs> Gosh. Oh, man. At, at Uber, every April 1st, we would come up with RFCs internally. I, I don't know if this is a common practice everywhere, but my team put together a few good ones. Uh, my personal favorite, I think, so far was... Uh, um, <laughs> the, uh, the we we proposed it to fork go um and there was a whole bunch of stuff that we the the, the april fools joke started very well that we we the, the the authors of the rfc proposed all of the all of the deficiencies of go that we would fix many of which were plausible but at the, but the very last thing we wanted was a come from operator um to <laughs> to go with the go to operator <laughs> so you could force execution to jump from a label somewhere else in your program to you. <laughs> um, yeah, that was a good one. Oh, anyhow. Uh, yeah, I've got enough to run with. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.